allowing us to be in your house, Father, to be able to talk about the great and wonderful things that you're doing in our church. Father, many, many opportunities to serve, Lord, and many people are stepping up, Father, to meet those needs and to serve in those areas. And God, we just so thank you, Lord, that your people that are called by your name, Lord, are reaching out to do this service. God, I pray for those that are on the fence about driving the van, Lord. I pray that they'll go ahead and step on out, Lord, trusting you in faith. And God, I pray for those that are praying about working in children's church, Lord. Those that are praying about working in the nursery. God, those that are praying about working in the hospitality. Father, in the men's ministries, the women's ministries, Lord. The list goes on and on and on, Father, of opportunities that we have, Lord. And I know you're calling your people. God, I thank you for those that are visiting, Lord, those that are praying about joining the church, Father. God, we lift those up that are sick, that couldn't be here with us this morning. Father, just so much going on in our church family. God, thank you that we have a place that we can come, that we can share those burdens, and God, that we can just worship you. God, I pray for Brother Jeff as he leads this morning, Lord. And God, you just fill him up, be with Miss Beth as she plays, Lord, and everybody that has a part in our service. God, I just pray that you just get honor and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Brother Jeff. Amen. Thank you, Brother Jonathan. It's good to see you here this morning. If you'll take a hymn, we'll turn to 133. We'll sing Shout to the Lord. 133. Six hundred fifteen. Trials mark on every hand.
Again, it's good to see you out in the Lord's house this morning. I hope you've been blessed already. Uh, if you weren't here for Sunday school, we want to invite you out. We've got many, many places to park you. Uh, if you find a place that, that you're not comfortable with, we've got several more. So don't, don't, be, don't be constrained to that. But as many of you know, this week we get to celebrate Veterans Day on the 11th, on Thursday. And that's a day set aside as a country that we can honor those that served our country. So I'm going to ask before, <clears throat> excuse me, I pray this morning, if our veterans, if there are any among us, if you'd just stand for just a moment so we can honor you, please. Amen. We're not applauding you, we're applauding your, your service. And we want to say a, a great heartfelt thanks for those of you that that put the uniform on. And I'm, I'm kind of curious this morning, if you've had somebody in your family, be it parents, children, grandparents, grandchildren, siblings that, that served this country, would you just raise your hand with me this morning? Wow, how awesome. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I do thank you for allowing us to be in this great nation. Father, to be here in this great county. Father, here among your great people. Lord, to be able to worship, to be able to sing praises to your name. God, just to be able to have somebody that we can go to, Lord, for comfort, for prayer. And Father, I want to say thank you so much, Lord, for the way this body prays for me and for my family. Father, I just thank you that they pray for each other. God, for the way they, they reach out, Lord, for the way they're quick to extend a helping hand, a shoulder as needed, Lord. Father, just to be that family that we so desperately need in this day and age. God, I thank you that this country was founded on godly principles. And Lord, though we may have strayed sometimes in the past, Lord, God, I still pray that you would turn our eyes towards you. That, God, we would be one nation under God, indivisible. Father, indivisible in seeking out your will. Father, so that everyone can have that salvationary liberty, that salvationary justice, Lord, for all. God, this morning as we look at your word, Father, help us to reflect on what we're really thankful for. God, this season that we have so much to celebrate, Lord, are we thankful about things that don't really matter? God, have we forgotten things that are so precious to us? Open our eyes. Open our ears. Open our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to talk to you about Thanksgiving this month, obviously, because this is a month we get to celebrate Thanksgiving. We get to gather with families, and I hope you're going to be able to do that. We get to sit down and share a meal. And I want to ask you, what are you most thankful for? I want to say thank you for, you know, your cards and your letters and your gifts of kindness to me and my family last month, uh, the awesome meal that we were able to have, and for your patience with me as I worked trying to get the, the funeral that happened that same day. Thank you so much for those little text messages that I get saying, hey, I'm praying for you or I'm thinking about you. You know, thank you for that. When you think about the things that you're thankful for, are there things maybe that you're thankful for that you don't think about? Um, yesterday, I, I changed oil in my car, and as a habit, I always flip the top off that windshield washer jug and fill that dude up. Because, you know, you never know you're out until you hit that lever and there's nothing there. So I got to thinking. I said, well, you know, my wife and my daughter, they may be out. So I went and Pop the top on theirs, and man, there went that gallon jug of, of windshield washer fluid filling theirs up, you know. What about those times when you get in the shower, and you're about to take a shower, and you reach for that bar of soap, and it's a minute little sliver. I mean, it's just, just barely enough to even sud up the rag with, you know. Or if you're like some of us, you sit down in the, the bathroom, and you realize there's no toilet paper. So you got to text somebody, hey, run me that in here, you know. There's a lot of things in life that we may be thankful for that we don't realize, we don't call in the mind. Things that are very important. 
I used to use the analogy of the magic sock drawer. You know, I was just I was just in awe that my sock drawer always had socks in it because my wife was filling up that sock drawer. I never had to worry about running out of socks. Well, when COVID hit and I got sent home to work at home, I became the magic sock drawer. And I, I know how it is to fill that sock drawer up. You know, just because something is familiar to you, the fact that, you know, your car cranks when you turn the key, the fact that your roof doesn't leak when it rains, you know, just because it's not on the forefront of your mind, though, does that mean you're not thankful for it? Those things that are so familiar, they're just so ingrained in our daily life, do we forget to be thankful for those things? This month, we're going to talk about being thankful for God, being thankful for family, being thankful for our calling, and being thankful for our church, our church family. And I want us to look at this morning, being thankful for my God. And I want us to see God as a personal thing, not as a corporate thing, down on our level, right here with us. And I want you to turn with me to Philippians chapter 4. If you know how to sing the, 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 the Bible verses through, it's God eats popcorn, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Usually where you can land on that one. When Paul wrote the, the letter to the church at Philippi, there's just, just lots of encouragement in there. A lot of Paul's letters are... You know, a lot of candy and axe mentality. You know, as long as you're taking the candy, I'm not going to whack you with my axe. But Philippians has a lot of, of goodness in it, a lot of wholesomeness in it. I'm going to have to take sippies because I'm still kind of struggling in the sinuses, me and my wife both. <coughs> Philippians chapter 4 and verse 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say, Rejoice. So, when is there a time not to rejoice in the Lord? When is there a time to ever let your guard down on giving God glory, rejoicing, thanking Him, just being so thankful? When I think about being thankful for my God, the first thing I'm thankful for is our fellowship. Because if I'm to rejoice in the Lord always... I've got to have fellowship, right? I mean, if you imagine you, you're in a relationship with somebody and if you don't have fellowship, you're not going to rejoice in that relationship, are you? Fellowship is being friendly in a relationship, having companionship. Do you consider yourself being friendly toward God and having a companionship with God? Who's your best friend on this planet? You know, you enjoy their company. You enjoy them as a companion. Obviously, you're friendly to them and they're friendly to you unless you have one of those love-hate relationships. Do you have the same relationship with God? 1 John 1.3 says, That which we have seen and heard declare unto you, that we also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Fellowship, companionship, walking through this life with God. Or do you imagine God being some cosmic being over in the corner with a zapper button just waiting for you to do something wrong? He's only the person that you call in when you've exhausted every means that you have available and you still can't fix it? Is God something that you hear somebody talk about that's always foreign to you and you don't understand how God can walk and talk and be with you all the time? Charles Spurgeon said, Fellowship with God was the richest privilege of unfallen man. Do you realize how privileged we are to be able to boldly go before the throne of grace to God, to prayer? To be able to talk and commune with a holy God? What an awesome privilege. But how is our relationship with God? We have to ask ourselves that question. Are we in a right relationship with God? Well, if you've ever broken fellowship, then you understand how valuable it is to be privileged to have a relationship with God. 
If you've ever had to ask for fellowship to be restored, then you understand how valuable it is. Have you ever been out in the pouring rain and there is no shelter? That's nothing compared to being out of fellowship with God. Everything just piles upon you. The weight is just crushing. Do you view God as a companion for your life? Someone to walk and talk with. Someone to seek advice from. Have you ever went to God and asked Him for advice on something? God, do you think I should buy this? God, do you think I should move there? God, do you think I should date this person? God, do you think I should be associated with fill in the blank? be honest with you, a lot of times we consult God on the way, don't we? If you don't want me to buy this, you better conk my car out because I got my pen out and I'm ready to go. If you don't want me to marry this person, you better make their head spin around backwards because it's going to happen. I'm going to go on, and if you don't want it, well, then I'm going to trust you to stop it rather than we engage God on the front end. <clears throat> How about God as a friend for life, forever? When you're thankful for all those things in life, where is God? As a comforter? Do you ever go to God to be comforted when you don't know which way to turn and you don't know how to handle those situations? Could it be said that maybe we're not thankful for our fellowship with God because we don't understand how precious it is? Another thing I'm thankful for from God is protection. God protecting me. Are we thankful for that godly protection? And you've got to ask yourself, well, does God really protect me? You know, we have insurance policies and we have cars that have five-star airbag ratings and, you know, we have smoke detectors and smoke alarms and we have safe rooms, you know, and we have the insoles in our shoes and all these kind of things. We try to protect ourselves. Do we ever realize those protections are coming from God? How has God protected you? Well, King David had a very famous verse talking about how God had protected him. In Psalm 23, 4, he says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. He doesn't say, I'm protected by God because He allows me to use my rod and He allows me to use my staff. He allows me to use my abilities to protect myself. He says God protects me with His abilities. And I think that's where we sometimes have a falling out because we are self-made. We're self-protected. We're self-owned. We're self-fill-in-the-blank. Do we realize that God is always there? Now, it's hard to explain why sometimes bad things happen to godly people. But imagine the things that could have happened that did not. Just let that sink in a minute. You could have been in that wreck, but you weren't. You could have been in that fire, but you weren't. You could have been in that storm, but you weren't. You could have been in that hospital room, but you weren't. Or dwell for a moment on the things that you know about without a shadow of doubt that God protected you from. You know. Because you can see the hand of God. Those times when you just narrowly miss that car. Those times when you just narrowly miss that instance. Those times when the piano fell <clears throat> literally like the cartoons right beside you. You know without a shadow of doubt that God had His hand in that. In this life, we'll have troubles and we'll have trials and we'll have turmoil, but the question is, how do we handle those things? Job said it like this in Job 14.1, man that is born of a woman is of a few days and full of trouble. Could we say we are a troubled people? <coughs> what kind of troubles do we face today? There's uncertainties about the future. There's uncertainties about the markets. Uh, food prices are going up. Gas can't get materialized. There's ships waiting off the coast to bring us all of our goodies. Can't get enough trucks in and out. Can't get enough folks to stock the shelves. 
We just can't get all the things that we're accustomed to. But King David said his valley of death was just a shadow. It's just a, it's like this shadow, this pulpit right here on the stage. It can't do anything. It's the pulpit that's holding up my Bible, my ball of water, my, my iPad, my, my tissue. It's not the shadow. But depending upon which way you turn the lights on, it's which way you see the shadow. It's always there. But it can't do anything to you. It's just the illusion of something. It's not a real valley of death. Just a perceived valley of death. When you think about those hills and those valleys in life, the hilltops are great, aren't they? It's such a beautiful view. And you can see all of the goodness and everything's going great. All the bills are paid. My back's not hurting. My hair looks great. My shoes feel good today. I mean, whatever it is for you on that mountaintop. But then you know you're going to get to slide down and go through another test, another trial. Because it's down in those valleys where you grow and you learn how to appreciate that mountaintop view even more. But fellowship with God does bring us His protection. And His protection does bring us clarity in our thinking. When you're having a hard time concentrating or trying to make a decision, get in that vein of protection. God is trying to keep us hemmed in into a safe place. Do we rejoice in the Lord always? God, thank you for protecting me five days of driving to Decatur. God, thank you for protecting me however many days driving here. God, thank you for protecting me through my sleep. Do we rejoice in the Lord always? Or do we just rejoice in the Lord sometimes? We talked about in Sunday school this morning. <coughs> do we just pray over our lunch on Sundays when we go out to the restaurant? Or do we also pray on Monday morning? or Wednesday morning, or Thursday, or Friday, or Saturday, when we're out with all of our buddies, do we say, hey, do y'all mind if I pray over this food before we eat? Do we rejoice in the Lord always, sometimes, or just when we think about it? When we're in line at the grocery store and we hear somebody say, the Lord is good, does that trigger us to say, yes, He is, and we ain't been triggered in a month and a half? Or are we always thanking God for His protection? The third thing I'm thankful for that God gave me is my salvation. Are we thankful for God's salvation? You know, I've got a lot of things that mean a lot to me. And I'm going to be honest with you, it's just junk in most people's eyes. I mean, but it was my great granddaddy fill in the blanks or whatever and it, it you know it means something to me and I'm, I'm I'm real protective of that and I'm real proud of that and I'm real vocal about that but what about my salvation you know and I like to do certain things and I mean I like to talk about certain things and I like to participate in certain things but what about my salvation do I tell about it while I'm talking while I'm participating Maybe it's because we don't fully understand just what God's salvation really cost. You see, Jesus talked about it in John 3.16 that God so loved us, the whole world, that He gave His only begotten Son, the only Son, that if whosoever put your name in there, that if you would believe in Him, you would never perish but have everlasting life. You can buy a brand new car and love that thing, I mean, and baby that thing and wash that thing and you let somebody back into it at Walmart and it is no longer a nice shiny new car. It's just a thing. I worked with a guy one time. He bought a black Chevy truck. Man, I believe he washed that thing every night. It never had a swirl mark on it. Oh, I love my truck. I said, you waiting to get your first scratch. Oh, no. I love my truck. I love my truck. I love my truck. Somebody ran into him 
knocked the bed slap off of it. They put the truck back together. Even as picky as I am, I couldn't tell the difference in the color. And he said, that's just a truck. It's been wrecked. I've seen guts and all. I don't, I don't think of it like I used to. Are we like that about our salvation? Remember back when you got saved. And how you would storm hell with a half full water pistol. Do you still have that same enthusiasm? Even though you've got a few scrapes and a few cuts along through life? Has anyone ever given their life for you? There are those that have laid down their life for this country. For this flag. But has anybody ever laid down their life for you personally? Has anyone ever given their child's life for you personally? God did. Romans 5, 8, God committed His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, there was enmity between us and God. Christ died for us. He died for you before you even came into being because He knew you would need a way. Have you ever had to repay scorn with kindness? There's that one person. And man, bless their heart, whatever they've done is just, wow, man, I'm telling you, there's just, and you have to repay that with kindness? You ever had to turn the other cheek? You know they don't know the Lord. You know they're lost. You know they're undone. You know they can just get right under your skin. Yet they need to know Jesus and they need to hear it from you. So you turn the other cheek and you take it. That's nothing compared to what Jesus did for us. What does salvation mean to me? Me personally. I know the definition in the dictionary as a state of being saved or protected from harm or being saved from risk. But since I have harm and risk in this life, what realm is this definition talking about? Where am I not going to have harm? Where am I not going to have risk? My salvation is in the afterlife. I will not be harmed in the afterlife. I will face no risk in the afterlife. You ever think about death? You know, you hear those little gnats in your ears saying, Death is the end. He who dies with most toys wins, and then you're buried and it's over and it's done with. Once you die, that's it. It's game over. It's black forever. Does that scare you? I think the older I get, the more that's on my mind about how is this life going to end and how is the next life going to take over. And when you sit and you ponder on that, it's just human nature to wonder is it true? Is this it? Or is there more? When I die, is it just just black forever? Or is there a secondary phase? See, I've never been there. I can tell you how to do a lot of things in life because I've been there. I shared with a guy that's, that's got a bad back. His back is hurting. And I said, listen, back surgery is not death. I'm living proof. I've been there. I've done that. But I've never died, folks. I don't... I can't tell you standing here what's on the other side from personal experience. But I've been with folks that left these walks of life. And I observed what I saw. I had a good friend one time that passed away. And he told us, he said, the angels are out there waiting on me. He told his wife that it was all going to be okay. And I heard him ask him, give me just a little more time so I can say my goodbyes. I had another good friend that passed away. And last time I got to see him, we talked and we prayed. And he assured me that he was ready. And he called his family in the room and he told them all that he loved them. And within just a few short hours, he went to be with the Lord. 
My wife was privileged to be able to take care of her daddy before he passed away. And the day before he passed, he wanted to go sit in this recliner. He loved his recliner and he loved his waterbed. That was the two things in life. And he wanted to sit in that recliner. And he was looking around the room. And he was shaking hands. He was speaking to the people in the room that nobody else could see. He was greeting those that had come to take him. And I was with my daddy when he passed. I was holding his hand when he reached for heaven. I didn't pull his hand up. How could a man laying there on that much morphine in that bad of shape that week, how could a man in that condition thrust his hand up? Because he was reaching for something. He was crossing over to the other side. And I know my daddy saw something. And that same salvation that pulses through these veins goes through me. I know it's real because I've seen it in action. Because I've seen people get changed in the moment in the blink of an eye. I've seen those demons be cast out. I've seen a change in life. I know there's a place that's for me and Jesus. And when those gnats come and whisper, and they say death is the end. All this is just a bunch of hooey. All this is just to keep people off the, the ditches and keep people on the straight and narrow. I remember the day I gave my life to Jesus Christ. If you ever have doubts, if you ever have fears, go back to the day when somebody comes to me and says, <coughs> excuse me, Brother Jonathan, how do I know I'm saved? I say, take me to the place. It was Orange Baptist Church. It was a revival. I don't remember what night it was. I was sitting with my buddies, and as usual, when you sit with your buddies, you don't pay attention. But that night, I paid attention. And whatever that preacher had, I needed. I remember going down. I remember saying, I'm lost. I'm undone. I need you to save me and forgive me of my sins. I need you to be Lord and Savior of my life. And I remember the weight being lifted off of me. I remember that just like it was yesterday. And I was nine years old. I remember how God has walked with me in fellowship even the times when I was running. I remember how God has protected me. I look back at the times when I could be no more and God brought me through those times. I remember how faithful God has been to me all these years and that's why I'm thankful for my God. How is your relationship with God? And how thankful are you to Him? Do you know Jesus? If you were like some of these stories that I told, when your time comes, will you see what they saw? I'm going to ask you to bow your heads with me this morning.